We're coming on the air with breaking news about President-elect Donald Trump. The Justice Department Special Counsel Jack Smith just filed a federal criminal case against the President-elect over his efforts to overturn the 2020 election results. The news comes the Justice Department had been planning to wind down its federal cases against Mr. Trump. It also comes as NBC News learned that before Mr. Trump returns to the White House. We want to go straight to our justice and intelligence correspondent, Ken Delaney and Ken Phillips. Mr. Special Counsel Jack Smith and his team have filed a sparse but historic document here asking Judge Tanya Chutkin to dismiss. He gave us essentially that the Justice Department has always held historically that a sitting president, president can't be prosecuted or applies here. Let me just read a little bit from what they wrote. Uh, they said that the department and the country have never faced the circumstance here where a federal has been returned by a grand jury and a criminal prosecution is already underway when the defendant is elected president. Confronted with this on counsel's office, consulted with the department's office of legal counsel, that's the group inside the DOJ that decides constitutional legal positions, the Justice Department has determined that the OLC's prior opinions concerning the Constitution's prohibition on federal indictment and prosecution apply to this situation, Lester. So, look, this indictment, this involves uh, the three conspiracies Donald Trump is accused of in an election, and it marked an extraordinary moment in American history. This is the first ever accusation that a sitting president committed crimes in an effort to claim. Also marks an extraordinary moment. Fifty years after Richard Nixon was forced by lawmakers from both parties to resign the presidency amid allegations, voters discounted equally serious charges of criminal misconduct in office against Donald Trump. They returned Mr. Trump to the presidency and was above the law. The lesson uh, of the Trump era is that a majority of Americans have decided that this principle no longer applies. And a filing in the other case, which has been dismissed by the judge, that classified documents case against Mr. Trump, which is on appeal. It's not clear exactly what that filing will say, because there are two other defendants in that case. And Jack Smith, the special counsel, is required to general before he leaves office explaining his prosecution decisions. Uh, and uh, the, Merrick Garland has a policy to see a public report, Lester. But in this case, we don't expect it to go much beyond the volume of material that is already in the public. All Lester. right, uh, Ken Delaney, and thank you. Let me bring in our senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett. Laura, what is the chance, putting politics aside, what's the chance of these four years from now? Very little. You and I both noted as the filing was coming in that it said without prejudice, which means theoretically they could bring it again. But it's been notwithstanding statute of limitations issues, all the effort and resources that were put into this, they never really got off the ground. They didn't get any much less the conclusion and sentencing. They just never got there. But between the delays with the Supreme Court decision on immunity and Trump's a real question now is just whether we even see a final report from Smith's office laying out sort of what evidence he would have adduced at trial. He was why he didn't bring any charges if there were anything, um, anything that he held back. He's supposed to explain. He had that. already developed a roadmap to get around the Supreme Court a superseding indictment, so essentially rewriting the indictment to be more in line with that, kept out some of the evidence that the Supreme Court said was off limits. Uh, stages of that, Trump was likely to appeal even that new indictment, and so it just really never got off the ground. So the facts didn't change, the evidence didn't change. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media. Kamala Harris was losing from the very start. Former President Trump will win the state of Indiana. He leads 19. Elect How he's piling up the electoral votes. Now, these early leads didn't necessarily mean anything. Those first polls closed in predominantly Rep Indiana, West Virginia, Oklahoma, Alabama, Tennessee, Missouri, South Carolina. One by one, they all turned red, and only a small handful of states turning blue. Vermont, Massachusetts, Maryland, D.C. Again, as expected, but that Harris had good reason to be optimistic. Organizers for the Democrats are quite happy with it. He is doing better with young voters in Georgia than Joe Biden was doing against Trump four years ago. Within just a couple of hours, every major New York like this. Uh, there's a lot of red on that map, a lot of red on that map. I don't think she can do it. How did that happen? And what was everything changed? Election night broadcasts all focus on the exact same. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. North Carolina and Georgia. That's because the vast majority of Americans are actually, and past history had pundits figuring Trump 
would win all of these, and Harris would win all of these. So, in the Electoral College votes, 270 is the magic number to become president, before the night even started, everyone just kind of assumed the to 219 in Harris's favor. And of all of those states, do you know how many defied expectations? Not one of them. That Trump will win West Virginia, not a very big surprise there. Vice President Harris has taken the electoral votes for New York, not a big surprises on the board. So all the attention was on the seven swing states, where polling told us things could go either way. Wall, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. These were states that had been reliably Democrat for decades until Republican, giving Trump a clear path to the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the United States, Donald Trump! ...managed to rebuild that blue wall, recapturing all three states. And if Kamala Harris would have any shot at winning the presidency her seats once again, that would put her at exactly 270 electoral college votes, no matter how any of the other swing states had his own path to victory. If Donald Trump wins North Carolina and Georgia, the vice president cannot win this race. Trump could also get to exactly 270 electoral college votes by taking Georgia, North Carolina, and none of these would go his way easily. In Georgia, Trump's early lead, what started as a more than 20 to 36 percent, would be whittled down bit by bit as more votes came in. Donald Trump in the lead with 54.8 percent. It's up 3.2 points statewide. In North Carolina, it was Harris out to an explosive early lead. Kamala Harris is in the lead. The biggest question mark of the night, which way would the election's most valuable swing state break? All eyes are on the... The moment everything changed was the realization that Harris's early lead, rate, and I'll explain what I mean. The early calls that Harris was wildly ahead in Pennsylvania. Take a look at first results. And if you round up for Vice President Harris, 27% uh, for Donald Trump. They were an illusion. Exactly one minute after polls, the results of more than 100,000 ballots. But they were all mail-in ballots, which, as a voting method, tends to skew Democrats. So, tends to skew Democrats. Ton of vote out there, by the way. I mean, there's no conclusion that the Keystone State. And that early lead did not hold. We're counted. Republican votes. That lead shrunk dramatically. From the high 70s down to the 60s, then into the high 50s. Only one third of the votes had been counted there. North Carolina tracked that same path. It took just for Trump to turn the tables on Harris, taking the lead in that state and never letting go. North Carolina would actually be the first swing seat call for Donald Trump. Former President Donald Trump will win the state of North Carolina. A big win for former President Trump it's would be the second battleground state to definitively fall Trump's way. The state of Georgia will go to former President Donald Trump. In the state of Georgia. This is a big win. In the immortal words of Bob Dylan, you don't have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind. At this point, Trump had a broader coalition of support than he'd had in either of the past two elections. And Harris was under historically been weak, but even where they had historically been strong. It's not mission impossible, but the more you get deeper into the count. She's got to win Pennsylvania. If she doesn't win Pennsylvania, it's over. So just after midnight Eastern time, she would come about as can without formally giving up. So you won't hear from the vice president tonight but you, tomorrow... You can see people already immediately leaving. If we can describe the start of this night as having the vibe of a wedding, morphing into what feels more closer to possibly a funeral. And about 90 minutes after that, the third Pennsylvania. By 2 a.m. Eastern, a majority of U.S. networks would call it for Trump, and both ends of the political spectrum would call the whole thing. Donald Trump has won the state of Wisconsin, which means he is the winner of this race. He is now the second president to win non-consecutive terms. You know, before election night, the bits would be divvied up. Who would win Pennsylvania? Could Trump break through the blue wall? Could Dems snatch up the Sun Belt? But by the time, whatever o'clock it was, Donald Trump was meaningfully ahead in every single battleground state. Georgia, we are now winning in Michigan, Arizona, Nevada. Now, the counts 
still aren't final. The potentially 350 million people where 50 states effectively run their own elections is that election night ended without a Importantly, Republicans have flipped the Senate, and they could still win the House, claiming both chambers of Congress under Trump's direction, depending on how the remaining count goes. That process will take time. But no matter how you look at one of the most dramatic political comebacks of our time, he won the Electoral College, he won the popular vote, and America's 40 feet, it's 47. I will not let you down. America's future will be bigger, better, bolder, richer, safe as ever been before. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Breaking news here right now on a day where President-elect Trump has dropped his Attorney General nominee, Matt Gates, who formally publicly withdrew today, got President-elect Trump announcing a new selection for Attorney General, former Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi. She was a side Donald Trump's impeachment defense lawyers at the first impeachment, uh, so she played that role for then-President Trump. In a new post that we got here, Donald Trump's Truth Social, he says he is announcing former Attorney General of Florida Pam Bondi as our, quote, next Attorney General of the United States, and he's 20 years uh, a contrast, of course, to Matt Gates's inexperience, and he says she was, quote, very tough on violent criminals and made the streets safe for Florida. This is notable, given the controversies. Uh, Donald Trump, in this statement, says, quote, the partisan DOJ has been weaponized against me, not because the DOJ to its intended purpose. Uh, we are following this breaking story. It came just moments ago here as we were covering the other DOJ. First uh, pick for AG, dropping out Matt Gates. And we're joined by Juanita Tolliver, who was covering that story with us. Welcome back. Uh, this is the thoughts on the on the fast naming of a replacement. I think the first thing that comes to my mind, Ari, is loyalty, loyalty, loyalty has been uh, right there. Yes, Kendrick, right there with Trump um, on his super PAC for the 2024 election. She helped the station of the 2020 election and vote counting in that election as well as apparently engaging in some of his previous cases down in Florida. Donald Trump fully expects to be able to pick up the phone and call and do his bidding. Remember, this is a behavior and approach that Trump, but apparently Barr had a threshold that prompted him to stop doing Trump's bidding around his push around 2020 election and, and over election. But Pam Bondi seems to be someone that he's plucked from Florida. We know he is a Florida man, but he's plucked because he's familiar with her from his super PAC now into the DOJ to do his bidding, which we know includes cleaning house over at DOJ for anyone who's been critical. Me, Juanita, I want to bring back Jason Johnson. Uh, you may remember him from, from such news events as <laughs> covering the DOJ 10 minutes. Thanks, Ari. It's a big um, news night. I'm going to have you, I'm going to let you get in here, but I, I'll tell viewers, because uh, I always try to keep it. Uh, this is how this works. We, we did book these two guests for a different Attorney General nominee story, um, <laughs> but I don't think either of you knew that this stamp on Donald Trump's statement tonight, 6.28 p.m. Eastern, naming Pam Bondi. I want to add a couple more details on that because it's a breaking story, and then Jason bring you a distinction that everyone should understand about this Attorney General nominee versus Matt Gates. Uh, many people, experts, nonpartisan officials, as well as Republicans, no experience as a prosecutor or in the kind of legal managerial work uh, that anyone would do at any leadership level at DOJ, let alone the top post. The contrast to Ms. Bondi is she does have that kind of experience, much more traditional than what you would see uh, in a top DOJ post, because she was the state of Florida and she has over 15 years experience in that role and other roles as a prosecutor. If you remember Kamala Harris running for president and talking about being a prosecutor, kind of job. And so in that experience, uh, it is much more of a traditional role, uh, something that the Senate Judiciary Committee and others who vet these kinds of as experience. The flip side, which our guest Juanita just mentioned, is Unlike traditional attorneys general, this is an individual who's very tied to uh, that he has talked about. And while there is nothing disqualifying about working on an impeachment defense, uh, it positions her not as someone who's a level prosecutor ready to rise up to the DOJ, but someone who's already been in those really searing partisan battles over Donald Trump's conduct in history general, who is not uh, overly tied to past partisan positions, even when they intersect, for example, with politics and law in Washington. Um, so that, Jason, um, I say that in, in, with all accuracy and fairness, on paper, uh, her state-level experience is much closer parties have sought at the DOJ. That's a huge difference with Matt Gates. Uh, the political part, though, is different. Right. And then what I bring to you is uh, history, and you have a proposed number two, a deputy attorney general who recently handled Donald Trump's criminal defense. So if this were the team, but if this were the team, 
This would be uh, two of the most politically defensive lawyers of the we've ever seen running DOJ at the same time. All right, I, I completely agree. And, and quite frankly, after Gates dropped out, it would be essentially somebody from Trump's legal team. It would be like a Jay Sekulow or somebody like that. I assume that's where he would get these people from. Unlike kids and like Janet Reno, right, occasionally attorney generals try to behave like they are not the personal lawyer of the president of the United States. That Bondi is exactly what I was saying in the last segment that we should all fear because she's competent. We may not agree with her ideologically, but she actually, anyone on the Democratic side or anyone who cared about liberty or justice was thinking, well, maybe Matt Gates will screw this up and that'll give us some time. No, Pam Bondi knows which situation. Remember, Florida is one of those states that's been very aggressive about migrants and deportation and moving people to different states and everything else like that. Florida has enacted all sorts of students and, and what they can do on campuses and, and, and finding legal justifications for manipulating education money. She is a dangerous and frankly worse than what we would have got with Matt Gates, even with the deplorable moral background that he has. Yeah, and I want to discuss that uh, with a little more depth with bunch civil rights, uh, LGBTQ rights, and other issues that are front and center at the DOJ, and which we know were also big campaign issues this cycle. So I've been very clear with viewers, this is breaking news, our, our guests are going to stay. But I'm going to go one-on-one -on -one and check in with someone who's been following all of the transition news very closely. I'm from Mar-a-Lago. I got a couple of questions for you, Vaughn, but first I'll let you report out uh, what you're hearing and what you think is important on what has been a very... Right, Ari. If, actually, if I could just kind of give you a sense of how this is going here at this point, because of Donald Trump's lack of these picks and making them like the Matt Gates pick uh, on the fly on his airplane as he was uh, coming back here to Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach, surprising and turning the heads of everybody. I, I was with a, a fellow reporter just about a block from where I'm standing now, and that reporter, my reaction was, for what? And I don't say that out of a disrespect to Pam Bondi, the longtime attorney general from Florida here, but because Pam Bondi, at least publicly, uh, of all of the, the litany of names that we were talking about to fill this capacity, she's somebody that, uh, as far as my understanding, the Department of Justice, yet she served here. She defended Donald Trump during his impeachment proceedings. She has been a frequent presence over cable TV, particularly Fox and other right-wing outlets defending Donald Trump from uh, during the course of his indictments to the... So uh, clearly, I think in Pam Bondi, I think there's a lot of questions that she'll undoubtedly face during the confirmation proceedings. But Ari, as you guys were just talking about, uh, of especially to what extent will Pam Bondi's loyalty extend to her going and seeking out political investigations? Will she be able to withstand throughout the course of his administration to any pressures or desires that Donald Trump, the president of the United States, wants a country's top prosecutor? Yeah, and, and let's dig into what you're reporting and what's striking here, because I, I don't mean to sound quaint or old-fashioned. Donald Trump's first term and most incoming presidencies, even, shall we say, disruptive, untraditional ones, there's a fair amount of vetting and thought that goes into selections. Uh, vetting uh, of, of several of these candidates is going to complicate the process, which, if you're a Donald Trump fan, that's a negative, because you'd like to see qualified people. Uh, we're reporting on the problems that ended Gates's nomination today. Pete Hegseth has had some problems that were apparently surprises to the Trump team. And so what you're, this came fast enough that it doesn't sound like to your, at least what you understand, that there was a sufficient or extensive debate. The candidate go down, uh, go lose, partly over vetting. Right. And as far as we are aware, those memorandums of understanding have been signed by this Trump transition team, meaning that they have not agreed to go through back, uh, FBI background checks or security clearances for enemies. There is no uh, federal funding that is going to this transition because it will require them to uh, to sign financial and potential conflicts of interest. So really, Mar-a-Lago is sort of operating on its own island, if you will, uh, in very literal. And uh, but this is for this operation. It's not just Pete Hegseth. It's not just Matt Gates, right, over sexual misconduct and sexual assault allegations. Her husband, Vince McMahon, in WWE are under Department of Justice investigation as we speak for uh, 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 allegedly trafficking by a WWE employee. And there's questions over the extent to which uh, Pam Bondi in this capacity, how she would use the DOJ. I think a series of questions about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as well, who has a deep, uh, difficult history. I think that uh, we as reporters have questions still out standing. So I, I think, Ari, this has been a very accelerated week of announcements compared to eight years ago when he, the Biden administration over the course of two months rolled out his picks. So I, I think that this, if you will, this will allow for public scrutiny for the next two pace of doing this. But uh, through at least the more formal, typical channels of the federal government, 
and the investigative bodies which have usually helped these public or journalistic uh, look at in these individuals to determine the extent to which these confirmation proceedings will be fruitful for them or not. Special Counsel Jack Smith has dropped both of his criminal prosecutions of Trump ahead of his return to the White House. Perez has been following this story for us. So, Evan, the judge in the federal election subversion case just granted Smith's request for the case also going away. Tell us about these new moves. Yeah, Alex, look, I, all of this turns on the verdict, essentially, that was fifth. They elected Donald Trump. He is president-elect, and as a, as a result, the Justice Department says that the prohibition against the president also applies in this case to Donald Trump. This is something we've never, ever faced, according to the special counsel, and obviously go and get uh, a reading from the Office of Legal Counsel at Justice Department, uh, which rendered that ruling. I'll read you just a part of what he says the department's position is that the Constitution requires that this case be dismissed before the defendant is inaugurated. This merits or strength of the case against the defendant. This also uh, is similar language that the special counsel, Alex, filed in due with the dismissal of those charges in the classified documents case. In this case, however, Smith is saying only dismiss the charge of the case going against uh, the two co-defendants, his two employees who were accused of uh, obstructing, helping him obstruct the investigation. Court filings, oh, Alex, is a, the, the special counsel is asking for the dismissal without prejudice, uh, which raises this while Donald Trump is in office. And in granting the request, Judge Tanya Chutkin re reiterates that language. She says to a sitting president is temporary, expiring when they leave office. So now, obviously, that raises the question, right? Uh, in, in just over four years, does that mean that this ca these two cases could be revived? That is possible, I suppose. Once Trump becomes president, he could order his Justice Department to go back to the courts and dismiss these, uh, these cases would be done and dead forever. One last thing, uh, we expect that Special Counsel Jack Smith is going to go ahead and produce a report. He, uh, if it comes before January 20th, Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, has promised to release that report. Alex? And could re uh, breaking news. Thanks very much. Our panel is here with reaction to this breaking story. Ellie Honig, I want to start with you. Trump has now officially evaded any for the January 6th attack, as well as his apparent alleged mishandling of the classified documents down at Mar-a-Lago. Break just happened today. Well, Alex, the bottom line is it's over. Both of these cases are over. Yes, Evan's correct. Technically, they were filed with they can be revived in 2029. That's not going to happen. Let's be realistic. Some prosecutor is not going to come in four and change years from now and revive these cases. It's over. And it's really important to understand why Jack Smith is making these moves. He's not making them because Donald Trump has promised to fire him. He's making these moves because of Justice Department policy that goes back to 1973. Jack Smith says, I asked DOJ to review that policy and they confirmed to me execution of Donald Trump once he gets sworn in on January 20th. So this is really a result of DOJ's institutional policy and institutional interest. Just noted, Judge Chutkin wrote, uh, quote, dismissal without prejudice is also consistent with the government's understanding. The president is temporary, expiring when they leave office. Uh, Michael Moore, is it unlikely this case is probably was just saying it is unlikely this gets picked up again after Trump leaves office? You know, I'm glad to be with you all. I, I'm completely on this. I don't think you're going to find a prosecutor who wants to come in and sort of clean up the mess. I, I expected that you would see the special counsel ask that sort of leaves a little bit of an ax hanging over the head of the administration. Uh, but it, it's not going to be uncommon for him now to, to send his his successors in to, to ask that the court change that. I don't know if Judge Chutkin will change it or not. But it's really a distinction without a difference. The likelihood years later, uh, it, it just it just doesn't strike me as something that's that, that's very realistic. And of course, you still got the question out there whether or not Trump could come in and just issue still got to be litigated, I guess, uh, if we go that way. But uh, this this will be a burr in his saddle, would be my guess, that he will not want out there. So it wouldn't surprise me to see if they try to clean it up within the first few months of his administration. And, and Lulu Garcia-Navarro, bigger picture that Donald Trump is above the law. 
Yeah, this was an unprecedented attempt to bring a former president. Those who thought that Donald Trump should be prosecuted for his actions on January 6th and his keeping of top secret documents argued, you know, that supporters... Uh, on the other hand, saw this as political uh, persecution, as, quote, lawfare. And leaving aside the merits of uh, Trump was trying to run out the clock on these legal cases, and he bet that he would win re-election. And the voters who wanted him back in power knew they either didn't care or they agreed with him that this was politically motivated. And either way, neither Congress nor our legal system nor constrained or punished Donald Trump for January 6th. So that's it. And certainly I think there's going to be a lesson in that. Yeah, a, a fair bit of frustration. They didn't move fast enough. Ellie Honig, you predicted last year uh, in, sorry, in last January, rather, in, in a book that you wrote that Trump's cases would of Attorney General uh, Merrick Garland's delay in appointing a special counsel, Jack Smith. You wrote, quote, when considering Garland's 93 chess prodigy movie, Searching for Bobby Fischer comes to mind, you've lost... You just don't know it yet. So, Ellie, explain why you forced it and what you think could have been done differently. Well, Alex, Jack Smith was named special counsel in November of 2022. And so that gave him exactly before the 2024 election. Anyone who's ever practiced criminal law in federal court, as Michael and I have, knows, there is no physical way a case like this, get it thoroughly investigated, go through all the grand jury, get it indicted, go through tens, uh, over 10 million pages of dis which obviously was lingering out there, would have to go up to the Supreme Court and did, and get the case tried and get a verdict in a two-year stretch. That is just a ongoing, or was, I guess, about whether Merrick Garland took too long. I think that debate is over, and we now have our answer. And, and Lulu, has been silent uh, about what happened today. Where do you think the Democratic resistance is against Donald Trump? Is, is there any kind of... No, in fact, quite the opposite. I think what you're seeing and what I've heard from uh, Democratic leaders is that they stay pretty quiet at the moment. I mean, they just had a pretty bruising election and there seems to be no appetite among them for any kind of resistance, unlike what we saw in 2016. But let's, again, put this into context. I mean, at this point, what leverage did Democrats lost all three branches of government? Uh, they tried to impeach him twice in his first uh, term and were unsuccessful and so didn't work. So there really isn't a lot left that they can uh, do for uh, do to Donald Trump, except maybe beat him at the ballot box. And two so, Michael, these are the two federal cases. There's, of course, the Georgia election subversion case. What happens to that one? Controlled by Jack Smith or DOJ policy. There's nothing out there that says that the case has to be dismissed. But the likelihood to me would be that uh, time during his administration. There was a hearing scheduled by the Georgia Court of Appeals on this whole issue of whether or not the district attorney should be re recused. There's been some rumble. That hearing was surprisingly, to many people, taken off the calendar by the judges. There was no real explanation. The, the court just entered a simple order. It could be for a number of reasons. It could be, number one, they think they've got enough evidence in the record or enough arguments in the record to make a decision about what to do. Uh, but you know, wait and decide the whole motion to dismiss issue and just wrap all this up at one time instead of having multiple arguments. You you, you could see that. The, the, the people that understand the federal and the state system, the state can act against a, a, a former president without the, his ability to pardon it. The reality would be bothered uh, with, with having to answer state court cases right. uh, during during his tenure. And so uh, I just think that case is the defendant's. Uh, this is not a team sport. Uh, they can still be called to the field to have to answer the charges that have been brought against them. But uh, as, as All right. Well, at least as far as Jack Smith is concerned, we'll, we know we'll hear from him again in that uh, final report, essentially, that he's going to be putting out. Ellie Michael.